Mr. Madison? Yes, what is it? Alexander Hamilton is here to see you. Will you receive him? Mr. Hamilton? Well, yes, of course. Uh, send him in. Mr. Hamilton? Why, what brings you to the federal city? Mr. Madison, so good to see you again. I'm here on business for a client, but I've heard some rumors about the 12th Amendment. Yes. That it's not passed. Hmm. Might we take a, a reprieve? I have some questions for you of the constitutional nature. Ah, oh, yes. I, I think maybe we should put some things to rest, and I would be happy to receive you. Take a seat, sir. Thank you kindly. Thank you, Mr. Madison. I'm in the capital city under business for a client, and I wanted to personally deliver my salutations to an old friend. It has been over 15 years since we collaborated in the creation of our Constitution, and I understand that the ratification of the 12th Amendment has now officially changed the method that we envisioned for the election of our Chief Magistrate, the President. <laughs> Your news is old, my friend. New Hampshire's legislature did indeed ratify the amendment, giving us the greater of 75% of the states needed for its adoption. But their governor has vetoed its legislature's vote. This constitutional dilemma reminds me of those days when we spent trying to foresee every circumstance of men as we sought to create the best possible government for our country. I remember our endeavors under Publius 15 years ago whence we ensured the ratification of our Constitution, when I hesitated not to affirm that if the manner of it be not perfect, it is at least excellent. Your arrival is providential. I was just going over my notes from our Federal Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. It is interesting how the rise of political parties result in this proposed amendment to our Constitution and therefore change how we elect a president. Will you not reminisce with me, Mr. Hamilton, and relate to why we forged our Constitution so? A small number of persons selected by their fellow citizens from the general mass will be most likely to possess the information and discernment requisite to such complicated investigations. By allowing the states to choose their electors, we retain the structure of the constitutional federalism. Each state can then best decide whom of their population can vote for electors or if their legislature shall directly appoint their state's electors. It was desirable that the sense of the people should operate in this choice of the person to whom so important a trust was to be confided. This end will be answered by the committing of the right to make it not to any pre-established body, but to men chosen by the people for the special purpose. All these advantages will be happily combined in the plan devised by the convention, which is that the people of each state shall choose a number of persons as electors, equal to the number of senators and representatives of such state in the national government, who shall assemble within the state 
and vote for some fit person as president. When we were creating the Constitution, we were working under the authority of the Articles of Confederation, where each state had one vote. This so greatly favored the small states as they had an equal vote to the large states. For this reason, I put forth the Virginia Plan, where each state's vote in Congress would be proportional to the size of its population. Your plan was adopted into the state's representation in the House of Representatives, but you had to compromise and give the small states equal weight to the large states in the Senate. This same sense of concession forced the three-fifths compromise for determining a state's population. But when we turned our attention to the executive branch and debated the number of electors each state would have for nominating a president, the small states again used their position of having an equal vote under the Articles to bargain a compromise similar to that of the legislative branch. Instead of working under democratic principles and attributing the number of electors directly to a state's population, the number of electors were based on a state's total representation in Congress. Two were granted, as in the Senate, and the rest determined by population, as denoted in the number of representatives. Now even the smallest of states would receive three electors, and the larger states would receive a smaller proportional benefit from the two additional electors. This is from my notes during the convention on September the 5th. Quote, Mr. Sherman reminded the opponents of the new made proposal that if the small states had the advantage in the Senate's deciding among the five highest candidates, the large states would have, in fact, the nomination of these candidates. And according to my notes on the next day, September the 6th, the final vote was changed from the Senate to the House. Roger Sherman moved to strike out the words, quote, the Senate shall immediately choose, and insert instead, quote, the House of Representatives shall immediately choose by ballot one of them for president, the members from each state having one vote, end quote. I am glad that you have those notes. It is important to note that we spoke of the electors as choosing the presidential candidates and that the House of Representatives would elect the president when the electors did not vote to a majority. They have excluded from eligibility to this trust all those who, from situation, might be suspected of too great devotion to the president in office. No senator, representative, or other person holding a place of trust or profit under the United States can be of the numbers of electors. Thus, without corrupting the body of the people, the immediate agents in the election will at least enter upon the task free from any sinister bias. Their transient existence and their detached situation, already taken notice of, afford a satisfactory prospect of their continuing so to the conclusion of it. We believe that the elector should be independent and free from potential profit from the president. Their duty was to pick the best possible candidates. the electors chosen in each state are to assemble and vote in the state in which they are chosen, this detached and divided situation will expose them much less to the heats and ferments which might be communicated from them to the people than if they were all to be convened at one time in one place. You are correct, sir. The electors can best make their choices when they are not swayed together by the single arguments of a popular candidate. We did not envision political parties limiting a field of elector candidates. Candidates were to be chosen from their merits and not their affiliations. The process of election affords a moral certainty that the office of president will never fall to the lot of any man who is not in an eminent degree endowed with the requisite qualifications, talents for low intrigue, 
and the little arts of popularity may alone suffice to elevate a man to the first honors in a single state, but it will require other talents and a different kind of merit to establish him in the esteem and confidence of the whole union, or of so considerable a portion as it as would be necessary to make him a successful candidate for the distinguished office of President of the United States. The business of corruption, when it is to embrace so considerable a number of men, requires time as well as means, nor will it be found easily suddenly to embark them, dispersed as they would be over 13 states in any combinations founded upon motives, which though they could not properly be denominated corrupt, might yet be of a nature to mislead them from their duty. We assume that as all the electors would meet on the same day in their respective states, it would be near impossible for the collaboration of corruption to be coordinated over every corner of our country on the same day. But we did not foresee the effect that coordinated political parties would have on our system. All these advantages will happily combine in the plan devised by the convention, which is that the people of each state shall choose a number of persons as electors, equal to the number of senators and representatives of such state in the national government, who shall assemble within the state and vote for some fit person as president. Their votes thus given are to be transmitted to the seat of the national government and the person who may happen to have a majority of the whole number of votes will be elected the president. As the electors are to choose two people they consider best suited to be president, one of which must be from another state, so as to force the electors to look beyond their state's borders for qualified men. The tally of all the choices of all the electors are given to the president of the Senate. Surely our diverse electorate would conceive of many great men suited to fill the role of president, thus ensuring the probability that none would receive a majority of the votes. General Washington aside, I cannot foresee any other candidate that can rally such a great majority. But as a majority of the votes might not always happen to center in one man, as it might be unsafe to permit less than a majority to be conclusive, it is provided that in such a contingency that the House of Representatives shall select out of the candidates who shall have the five highest number of votes, the man who, in their opinion, may be the best qualified for the office. I have here in my notes, Mr. Hamilton, a portion here I would like to read to you. On September the 4th, 1787, I said that I was apprehensive that by requiring both the president and vice president to be chosen out of the five highest candidates, the attention of the electors would be turned too much to making candidates instead of giving their votes in order to a definitive choice. Should this turn be given to the business, the election would, in fact, be consigned to the Senate altogether. It would have the effect, at the same time, I observed, of giving the nomination of the candidates to the larger states.
Now, I recall in the delegates convention in 1787 on that hot summer in Philadelphia, I happened to note that Mr. Morris said, by this they were limited to five candidates previously nominated to them. Nothing was more to be desired than that every practicable obstacle should be opposed to intrigue and corruption. These most deadly adversaries of Republican government might naturally have been expected to make their approaches from more than one quarter, but chiefly from the desire in foreign powers to gain an improper ascendant in our council. How could they better gratify this than by raising a creature of their own to the chief magistrate of the union? Now, when the final vote for president is taken by the House of Representatives, the chance that any foreign country may sway our election is all but eliminated. Now the Twelfth Amendment seeks to solve the problems we endured during the latest election. No longer is the candidate with the second most votes to be vice president. Electors must now split their two votes between president and vice president. When there is no majority or a tie vote from the electors, the president is chosen by ballot of the three candidates with the highest elector votes. Without a majority or a tie, the vice president is chosen in the Senate by a ballot from the two candidates with the highest electoral votes. Does the Twelfth Amendment change the role of electors as nominators of presidential candidates? No. I have here a copy of the speech of Connecticut Senator Uriah Tracy. And uh, if you'll indulge me, Mr. Hamilton, I'll pull that out. It was on December the 1st in uh, 1803 when the Senate was debating on the Twelfth Amendment. Now, he reaffirmed the role of electors to nominate the choices for president, and he stated, and I quote, as the Constitution stands, each elector is to write the names of two persons on a piece of paper called a ballot. Nothing can be more obvious than the intention of the plan adopted by our Constitution for choosing a president. The electors are to nominate two persons, of whom they cannot know which will be president. Under these rules, John Adams in 1789 and Thomas Jefferson in 1796 would have had their positions of vice president decided by ballot in the Senate, since both failed to amass the majority of elector votes. Very interesting. If the amendment passes, it would be no longer necessary for somebody like me to lend weight in choosing of the president like I did in the last election. Did you know that President Jefferson never thanked me for getting him elected? Conversely, Vice President Burr never forgave me. <laughs> Mr. Hamilton, I believe you give yourself too much credit. Possibly so. Well, the hour is late, my friend. I must be off. I have a matter of honor tomorrow to settle in New York with our Vice President. Mr. Burr, yes, I have uh, read about it in the papers. I regret uh, that this is going to take place, but I can only ask if you have your affairs taken care of. I do. I have written my letter to my dear Eliza. But I don't expect it to go that far. I have no intention of shooting Mr. Burr. But I still will represent myself. Tomorrow's another day. Indeed. Well, give my best to your dear Eliza. And uh, all my best to you, sir.
Thank you very much for the hospitality. It's very good to see you again. I wish that we don't wait as long to make such another union. Indeed. Godspeed. And uh, what do you think? Should we uh, mention this to uh, Mr. Jefferson? <laughs> as you wish. As you wish. Good night, sir. Good night. And all the best.